where I tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you're hearing now things, and what we got, I do. Thank you, staff. Like, please be seated. Yes, sir. And if you can give us your first, last name, spelling your last, you can be seated too, sir. My name is Giorgio Curlo. My last name is spelled K-I-R-Y-L-O. And if you can please give us your rank, uh, your current duty station, and those obvious I'm a staff sergeant in the Marine Corps. I'm stationed at 1st Marine Raider Support Battalion, Camp Pendleton, California. Good afternoon, Staff Sergeant. Good afternoon, sir. Could you please uh, tell the jury a little bit more about your background? When did you first enlist? I enlisted in 2005. I was born in uh, Jackson, New Jersey, grew up in New Jersey. I was in high school when September 11th took place. There was a lot of phone calls to the front office that day. A lot of kids getting news about family members. Um, that was the day that defined my purpose, and I realized I was going to join the Marine Corps. I enlisted, and uh, there was a while before I could ship to boot camp, so I enlisted when I was 18, and I got to boot camp right after I turned 19. My first duty station um, after A school in Pensacola was the Center for Naval Intelligence in Damnet, Virginia. I then transitioned out to 1MEF, uh, the 1st Radio Battalion, where I immediately deployed in support of an intelligence gathering effort in Jordan in 2008. I then deployed to the uh, 13th MU in 2009, where we were witness to the, um, the piracy crisis in the Straits. I returned three months after that. I was uh, deployed to Afghanistan, so three months off from my MU to Afghanistan, OEF 10.1, where I supported 3-4 uh, and 1-2 in their RIP in Nauzad. I transitioned to Musikala, to northern Musikala, Panda Ridge operation, clearance operations in Karamander, and formed PB Griffin. From there, I went to the Farah Farah province. Um, my job being somewhat different, I was sent to many different commands based off of where the the trouble point was. In Farah, I supported an ODA on an intelligence operation and then transitioned from Farah to the 3-7 and 3-5 RIP, where I remained with 3-5 in Sangin past the elections. I was supposed to go home after six months, but unfortunately, um, some members of my unit couldn't make it out on deployment, and I was asked if I would be able to stay for the whole year in Afghanistan, and I volunteered and said yes. So. I stayed with 3-5 through the fight in Sangin and moved up with PMT to Kajaki towards the end, right around uh, January of 2011, where I finished my Hellman tour of that year in 2010. I returned and went to an advanced SIGINT school in 2011 in Quarry Station in Pensacola. I got a new MOS, and from there I decided that I still didn't want to be indoors, and I put in my package to go to Marsoc. Went to the pipeline in 2012, um, and that's where I currently serve as a SOC staff. I have uh, deployed twice with MORSOC, once to OEFP in the Philippines, where I conducted a phase zero shaping operation for intelligence, and then the second time I deployed with 2nd Raider Battalion out of Camp Lejeune to Iraq uh, and fell under SOTIP North. And that's how I'm here today. You said your current MOS is? <clears throat> I'm an 8071. I'm a SOX F. I'm a special operations capable SIGINT specialist. And can you explain um, a little bit about what that, what that job is? It's a rather sensitive, uh, talking, talking roughly about it, I form an intelligence picture and provide terminal guidance for soft elements. I form the um, the electromagnetic and electronic spectrum battle space. Um, similar positions in the Navy, they're known as TACIWs. We have a uh, slightly higher standard uh, in MARSOC. And typically we deploy uh, on an MSOC. Turning now to the 2017 deployment, um, you, you deployed to Iraq in that year? I did. I deployed with India Company, 2nd Raider Battalion. Just once again, based on the battle space and the force layout, um, there's not a lot of me to go around. And I was placed in the point of most contention. And that was supporting 
SEAL Platoon. Originally, I was on a SEAL Platoon with SEAL Team 5. Transitioned from there to support an MSOT for the initial clear of Mosul, and then ultimately SEAL Team 7 with uh, our platoon. Okay. Uh, zeroing in on the SEAL Team 7, is that Alpha Platoon? Alpha Platoon. Okay. Can you describe to the jury when you first were assigned to Alpha Platoon? Uh, my, my first meeting with the platoon was slightly contentious. Um, anybody who's ever been in a position of an enabler has had or just really an outsider, I didn't do a workup with this platoon, and the first time I met them was after about two weeks of clearing operations that I had just conducted with an MSOT. It was their very first operation in Mosul. I had already been there a while, and I'd already not been sleeping for a while, or eating or showering, and I showed up to the platoon to hop on the trucks on what I thought was I was already on the op order with my linguist in tow at around 5.30 in the morning for clearing op. And that's when I first met uh, Chief Gallagher and the rest of the platoon. How did that meeting go? It was not good. Can you explain? I have kind of a maybe a little too in your face. Uh, every once in a while, I've been accused of not having tact when introducing myself or introducing my skill set to a team. And I believe um, I came off on the wrong foot with not only Chief Gallagher, but everybody on the platoon. Um, he didn't want to get me in the trucks, and I kind of insisted that this job that he doesn't know that I do, it's so important that I have to be there, so you have to move over one of your operators so I could hop in the truck with my linguist and all my equipment, X, Y, or Z. So I basically had to fight my way onto that op that day, and definitely didn't make the greatest first impression. And did there come a uh, meeting after that? Yes. We did our first clearing op together, uh, returned to post-process all the data I collected, and then I returned to Alpha Platoon's team house. At the time, I was not living with them yet. I was still living in the space that the MSOC had <coughs> occupied. And prior to me being able to walk into the platoon space in this house, I was confronted by uh, an unknown sailor who started to chew my ass. And I sat there, and I recognized that, you know, I kind of a jerk that morning. And uh, this guy's chewing my ass, and I don't know who he is, so I'm just going to sit here and take it. And he gets done, and I'm standing at parade rest, and at the end of it, he asked me, well, do you have anything to say? And, I, and I, I said, well, number one, I don't know who you are. I don't know what your name is. I don't know what your rank is. My name is Staff Sergeant Curlow. And he started to laugh. We, we laughed about it because I just got my ass chewed by this, this random guy. And it turns out this random guy was introduced himself as the LPO, uh, Craig Miller. I think he was an SO1, SO1 Craig Miller. So, yeah, that was, that was our first, that was my first, you know, interaction on my ass chewing. After that, did the dynamic improve when you were in the platoon? It did. It took a couple weeks of operating together for them to realize exactly what I brought to the table. Normally, we're able to do a workup together so they fully understand our, you know, our capabilities and what we bring. In this case, I pretty much just had to demonstrate it and still talk through you know, some classified portions with those that had the appropriate clearances and talk through my capabilities to the rest of the platoon for those that didn't. But eventually, I'd say after about two weeks of operating together, and I started living with the platoon at that time, everything turned to be a great, great working relationship. Closer to the tents? Absolutely. Can you describe to the jury some of the dynamics of the platoon you observed? So from the get-go, I realized that the platoon was extremely junior. I didn't, uh, in, in getting to know everybody's range of experience, some of the things that they've done, I realized very quickly that most of these guys were on their first or second deployment. It was certainly their first combat deployment. Um, the platoon was very green. They were young. They were untested. They were super, you know, um, not to talk around a generalization, but they were very much young Navy SEALs. Very cocky, but still very green. What about the chief? Chief was old school. Explain. Absolutely. Uh, chief Gallagher definitely had a strong leadership style, very gruff. 
kind of exactly what I've been used to in the Marine Corps, um, and really what I've come to expect out of the special operations community uh, as kind of a, as a senior leader. Um, <coughs> I think that he addressed his men appropriately when it comes to my perspective as a Marine. Every once in a while, getting called. <coughs> You know, every once in a while, I'm used to getting called, hey, you're being a shithead, or come over here, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's, the, um, that's the way he treated the platoon, and, you know, his expertise was on display as well. Can you describe uh, to the jury the kind of operation you guys were doing? Like, what, what was going on in Mosul at that time? Triple X. Um, advise a company and assist a uh, partner nation force in the clearance of Mosul. I was um, forming the and attempting to form the SOTIF's intelligence picture through signals intelligence, supporting the team with their force protection and INW. We were doing direct targeting of ISIS based off of targets of opportunity, whether we observed them, whether our internal UAS, the Puma, observed them, whether or not we got an intel tipper from another source or it was generated from myself and my linguist. And was this a kinetic environment? You know, this was an, an extremely kinetic environment, but not in the traditional sense of what we define as combat. It was, a, it was an incredibly target-rich environment, but it wasn't the um, day-in and day-out gunfight that we used to get into in Afghanistan. How was the uptime level? Very high. Chief Frank? Chief Gallagher, uh, Lieutenant Fortier were extremely outspoken within the SOTA to getting us work and um, pressing the fight to the enemy. Pressing the fight to the enemy as best we could. You know, while we weren't closing with, we were getting ourselves in the best position both to support ERD, our Iraqi counterparts, when they were moving, and also when they weren't moving, just kind of trying to press the fight as best we could from another vantage point on the battlefield. I would say that the op tempo was the highest of any soft maneuver element in Soda of North or Iraq at the time. There was. There was this. Uh, there was this general undercurrent that existed with the the E6 and below, uh, of which I was a part of this group. And um, anybody who's ever been in a group of men who has to work for another group of men, you occasionally disagree with your leadership. So there's gripes and complaints. There's a bitch circle that exists in every single group of military men. No matter who it is, no matter how much they like their leader, no how much I know you know how how matter much they you know disagree with that. So the uh, the general undercurrent in the platoon was that um, from the beginning Eddie's a rock star, and then all of a sudden, after a few months of us doing these triple A missions, not doing DAs, not doing halves, not doing gaps, the op tempo being high but not a lot of work being shared across the platoon. These guys started to look for reasons that Gallagher was just being a shit firm, if you will. And before I dive back in, that, uh, you said a couple of acronyms there, AFS and GAPS? Helicop helicopter Assault Force and Ground Assault Force. So traditionally, we're dropped off at a compound. We run up and shoot everybody on the inside if they're bad. So you said that the platoon developed a certain impression of detail. They did. So we would get uh, we would get these care packages sent out from an organization that would send, you know, uh, an American Legion associated organization that would send care packages forward. Uh, we would all go through them. Originally, a lot of the complaints stemmed that um, Eddie was going through the care packages and taking things before anybody else in the platoon could get to them. I didn't observe that. I observed the gripe circle, and I was definitely a member of it. I never tried to squash it. I didn't feel like it was my place, kind of being an outsider, regardless of 
my experience. Um, Did you ever see him actually taking anything? Absolutely not. Did it become almost like a joke that any time someone goes missing? Yeah. It was actually the punchline of a joke. Eddie must have taken it. He were gonna, the platoon was going to put him on missing gear statement. So the accusation was levied uh, by Petty Officer uh, Miller that response. Government response. The objection is overruled. You may proceed. The platoon <clears throat> purchased, Navy SEALs, believe it or not, purchased Gator sunglasses, and they were all matching with the platoon logo on the right side and an American flag, or the platoon logo on the left and an American flag on the right going forward into battle. Each member of the platoon purchased a pair of sunglasses that was identical, and we wore them on operations. The There was an accusation levied that Chief Gallagher had stolen a pair of sunglasses from Petty Officer Miller. About a few days after this taking place, there's a couple ops um, in between here and there. I walk into his room, and I am saying small talk, trying to get dipped from somebody. Uh, he lived with Dalton and DeLay. And he moves his rack aside, and we both hear something slide against the wall and hit the ground. And he bends over, and he looks... And he picks up his sunglasses that he had misplaced. Yet he had said that uh, Chief Gallagher had stolen them. So I watched him, and he kind of had like a funny look on his face. And we all like looked at each other because at this time, he was very much friends with these guys, and we all thought it was very funny. I want to shift a little bit. Did you hear them complain about tactics? Yes, they complained often. I came from a, um, obviously, a, a background not as a grunt, but somebody that has extensively supported grunts and extensively supported sniper operations. Um, normally, in filling under the cover of darkness, um, at any compromise, whether it's a dog barking, um, uh, an Afghan coming into a field, and just getting that feeling that we're compromised, we would boogie out. Our operations were uh, conducted during middle of the day, under direct observation, often uh, by ISIS spotters. And many of us in the platoon complained about some of the very aggressive, kind of in-your-face tactics as not being tactically sound for conducting urban sniper operations. Now, eventually, my impressions of those operations changed. The SODIF had imposed, or it, it's really a, um, it was really a, a rule that came from the sea jock that there was this in, this thousand meter invisible line that we were not allowed to cross in re regards to the, the forward line of troops, and then on the other side, the flat. So at any one point in time, we were forward line of enemy troops. So there was, there was a buffer between the, there was a buffer there, <coughs> sometimes a block, sometimes a major highway network. So in terms of being 1,000 meters, we'd be 1,200 at times away from ISIS. <coughs> the, the danger level of, of direct fire engagements, uh, we, we would get shot at fairly often. But the fire wasn't effective when we could just walk downstairs. Um, I soon realized that we were doing things aggressively in order to draw ISIS out. Originally, I was under the mindset that that's not what we were, what we, you know, it wasn't a sound tactic. Right. And I was, I was a part of all of those gripe circles. Did the rest of the platoon realize that there was purpose behind this? I do not believe that they ever did. Did you have hot watches at the end of every operation at the platoon level? Really only 
only in the beginning. Um, typically, every every unit that I've been a part of post operation, even for <coughs> a logistics convoy, we would do a hot wash. In MARSOC, we always do a hot wash after every op, even in training. Um, things that we can improve upon, things that we did well. The platoon originally started doing this, and eventually I, it fell off. I would say after about a month, we would get home and everybody would go to the winds. Eddie was the, the tactical lead. He would pick all the OPs. He did that in coordination with a couple of the other snipers, but he was the final say when it comes to the selection of those OPs. And those OPs, by the way, had to get, in essence, approved by the SODIF. Uh, we had to be allowed to go to where we wanted to go. But Eddie was the definitely the tactical lead in the platoon. Okay. And then how did he assign <coughs> He actually, uh, in, in something that I recognize later that I'll, that I'll take on further in my career, he did a very good job of rotating every member of the platoon through all of the um, positions in the platoon. So at any one day, there would be a school trained sniper in OP and a guy, that, a, a new guy in the OP that's never touched a sniper rifle in his life. And Eddie would rotate all of his new guys through um, different OPs. Everyone became proficient um, the way that he would do this rotation. If you weren't in a sniper OP, you were in a mortar, or you would be manning a crows, or assisting with the puma, or shooting a switchblade, or shooting a javelin, or a Carl G. So there was a there was a definite rotation. The mainstays were the school the school trained snipers were often included in every single operation when they were actually in Mosul. Now. My function, um, in particular, the, the intrinsic details of it is extremely sensitive. But I form the team's um, intelligence picture, and I form a, a targeting picture for um, the team and the SODA based off of the electronic spectrum. Now, is that something you do uh, from behind the, you know, some type of a talk or something, or do you do it out? Absolutely not. I have to have proximity to the enemy to do my job. So you're in the towers with me? I am. Okay. How often would you go out to the platoon? Every single off. How did the rest of the platoon um, settle this? Were they all, go all going out every single off? No, they were not. Can you explain? The platoon was put on a uh, blue-gold shift based off of the footprint of some of these OPs and the, the fact that we didn't need everybody in the platoon on every single off. Eddie would rotate half of the platoon back to our team house in Sheikh Khan, Iraq, which was a mansion, and it was a paradise, and everybody had a bed, air conditioning, would go on trips to the hook, and half the platoon would be in Mosul conducting operations. This was done on roughly a two-week schedule for the majority of the deployment. Was there any, you said you went out on every app, right? Yes, sir. So did you get to do this? Blue gold rotation? No, sir. What color were you? Go. Okay. What about uh, anybody else who would go? Yes, sir. Who? Uh, Lieutenant Fortier, mm -hmm. TC Byrne, and Eddie. Now, from your position there, and again, I don't want to get into anything we can't out here, but um, were you able to share the information that you got with all the members? At the appropriate classification level, based off of their clearance, yes. Can you explain? Not everybody in the platoon had a clearance appropriate to um, understand or for me to articulate to them the ins and outs of exactly how I do what I do. Sometimes even the precision of what I do is classified at the TSSCI level. 
Lieutenant Fortier had a TSSCI, and so did Chief Gallagher. So I was able to explain the intrinsics. For everyone else, I would just declassify it to that level, and everyone had that full information flow from me appropriately. Okay. So certain members of the team had more information than others? Absolutely. Okay. And can you explain an example? What kind of information are we talking about? Composition of, well, without getting into the classified realm. Well, let me ask you in a different way. When you dumb it down to an unclassed version, you put it out on the internet, right? I did. Okay, so if I'm a, if I'm an SO2 on the other end of the platoon net, what kind of thing would I hear from you, as an example? Hey, ISIS is going to be moving a, uh, a shipment of ammo with two women. Um, they're going to be moving under the bridge. And it sounds like it's happening right now. Okay. Now, you said women. Is that something that ISIS frequently do? All the time. And what kind of information does a platoon need in order to engage a combatant? You just need a, a positive identification of that person was ISIS. Okay. And how would they develop that positive identification? Sometimes, um, sometimes it would. It, I, I would like to think that I played a major role in that. Um, ISIS would not want to be seen with a weapon on the battlefield, just like in Afghanistan. But I have the ability, through um, the precision of my job, to identify individuals in the battle space who are ISIS. And would you pass that information to members of the team? I would, but in that unclassified speed. Right. And then they could use that to target those individuals, correct? Yes, sir. Did anybody in the platoon ever come back and ask you <clears throat> if they had targeted somebody that they should have? Yes, sir. Can you explain? There were a few instances in the course of this deployment where there were snipers who had questioned whether or not they had killed a combatant or not. Most of the time, I believe it had come from my reporting, and times when I was certain, they would come to me and they'd say, hey, I, uh, that chick that I shot today, was, uh, was she actually ISIS? And I was able to confirm it for them. And, you know, there, you know, there, there was a couple of instances where members of the platoon came to me and asked me those questions. What about Eddie Gallagher? Not once. Did anybody come to you and ever say, hey, I saw Eddie shooting old men today? Was that legit? I mean, they would have. <laughs> Did they? No. Sustained. After the curative instruction was issued to that answer. All right, members, I've sustained the objection. You should disregard the answer. Go ahead. Did anybody come to you and say, hey, I saw Eddie do this? Was that good shooting? No. Was it clear to everybody in the platoon that you were available to answer those types of questions? Then? Absolutely, I was a member of the. I was a member of the E six and below grad crew. Now, in your position in these sniper heads, do you maintain pretty good situational awareness of everything that's happening? I would like to think that I had better situa situational awareness. I knew what the enemy was doing. So, for example, when the snipers are engaging, you have a pretty good idea of what they're engaging? Absolutely. Okay. Did there come a time when Chief Gallagher was engaging something that didn't make sense to you? No, sir. Okay. What happens when U.S. forces engage something that they shouldn't have in this particular battle? We confronted this issue um, with ISIS using um, a couple of bad drops and a couple of direct fire incidences that had nothing to do with us um, as a major propaganda chip in the, uh, in the war of the press. So ISIS would place uh, mannequins on the roof of compounds where they would stuff women and children into the bottom of them. 
and we, we had an FM, FMV signature of a guy standing on a roof with an AK-47, and we would drop a bomb on it, and we would inadvertently kill 50 or 60 women. And they were very good at this. And um, there was one particular instance that uh, is very, very, very fresh in my mind, where we shot a smoke mission uh, to protect civilians who were trying to flee the Mosul hospital. And ISIS used the smoke coming down and the burning fragments as a propaganda chip that we were shooting white phosphorus into civilians. And they were machine gunning civilians in the street, and this, phosphor and this, this was sitting on them. So they were very good with their propaganda team. You're aware of some of the allegations against your caliber? I am. Did you ever see any of those things? Absolutely not. That's something that ISIS would have used for propaganda if it was true. Anything that we would have done that would have harmed a civilian, regardless of who it was on the platoon, would have been used against us. You spoke earlier about women, that ISIS was using women? Extensively. Were they also dressing up as women? Yes, they were. <laughs> did any other members of this platoon, did any members of this platoon kill women on this deployment? Yes, I believe the majority of the platoon did. Turn your attention to um, May 3rd. Do you remember that day? I do. What were you doing on that day? Can I talk about May 2nd first? Yes. <clears throat> sure. Part of my duties in uh, performing my job and doing the intelligence soak of the battlefield is preparing targets for the soda as well as my platoon. I the night before, in the days uh, preceding our clearing operations, I prepared um, basically an overview of what the major ISIS C2 was in the area, composition of fighters, like the who's who in the SIGINT world of who we were going to kill and who would be trying to kill us. And I developed some pre-planned targets um, really for ease of use for targeting. If we go out the <coughs> next day and I get indications that this target's active, I already have all the intel built on it that we could just drop it before they kill us. So the night of May 2nd, I had given the mortar line, which was being run by uh, Petty Officer Miller, uh, Lieutenant Portier, Arrington, and the Soda, uh, six pre-planned targets for the next day, the most important to me being ISIS command and control. go out on the op on May 3rd. We set up in position in this, uh, it was an abandoned administration building or factory or one or the other. Most of Mosul was blown out, but it was a very large structure. And I am placed in a truck in the right most of the battlefield, observing the battlefield um, with Crow system, my linguist, and my SIGIN equipment. For this particular operation, where I was was sufficient for me to collect on the to electronically monitor the enemy, as well as man a position. The morning was a great, great morning for the platoon. Our partner force started the clear, and ISIS was coming out of the woodwork in a shooting gallery that stretched uphill into Mosul. ISIS had to retreat uphill, and we were able to Cut a lot of them down with our crows. At crows, range. crows the uh, 50 cal or you know the, the system that's a it's an automated machine gun with control like a video game. So good morning all around. Lots of lots of 50 cal from the platoon fired into groups of ISIS that were firing on us. Um, around this time, I get intelligence indicating that the battlefield commander is trying to work his troops. I get a the enemy battlefield commander. I get a, a geolocation to a pre-planned target. I inform Lieutenant Portier that I have PID, that this guy is actively directing ISIS forces, not only against our partner force, but knew that we were there. And PID, PID is positive identification. Right. Electronically, I can do that with a, a massive amount of evidence that's very, 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 very precise. Okay. What did they do? They prosecuted it with an airstrike. Two, uh, 
in coordination, uh, Joe Arrington, our SOTAC, uh, prosecuted two hellfires into that compound. Right after those hellfires go off, my linguist and I noticed that the uh, ISIS commander just magically goes off the net, which is normally an indicator that we got. Okay. What happened next? It's a decent lull in the fight. The, our partner force moved very quickly that day, um, knocking that C2 node out, gave them, they didn't have the ability to rally any troops, so they all just beat him out, out, they were gone. Two hours go by of just not a lot of anything happening. Um, our partner force occasionally would take lunch and, in, a, in a weird time, and ISIS would take lunch as well. So, two hours go by, and the minor amount of boredom is set in. A Humvee rolls into our uh, compound with a whole bunch of Iraqi soldiers around it, and a guy it looks like he's dead on the hood of it. Uh, they're running up. I got my linguist outside. I think we're smoking a cigarette. And they're running up, and I'm like, what, what is he saying? I say, oh, this is the, uh, this is the ISIS guy from your guys' airstrike. This guy's from the, the airstrike. So this was the, uh, this is the first, this is the first live um, ISIS member from our battlefield that our platoon had seen. The only one that they'd seen in this entire deployment comes rolling in on the, the hood of the something. We seen the only one they've seen, meaning seen up close, right? From our battlefield. Okay. They've seen det detainees up close, but that wasn't from our airstrike, our platoon's fight that day. So what did you do? I took my linguist over to the truck to do a small amount of tactical questioning on this guy. Um, just to really make sure that there wasn't anything that was going to harm my team or the ERD further. What did you ask him? I asked him his name. I asked him how old he was. He said he was 17. I don't remember his name. I asked him if he was a member of ISIS, and he said he was a member of the Furkan Brigade. I asked him who his, uh, who his battlefield commander was and who the guys were that he was <coughs> fighting with. And he said that he was fighting with six guys and that they were all dead <coughs> and that his commander and I forget his name, was dead as well. At this point in time, me and my linguist look at each other, and we you know, give each other a high five, because this was, this was the fruits of our platoon's labor, and that was our confirmation that, you know, that not only was that airstrike good, like, that killed that C2. So. So what'd you do? I sent that report up to the SODIF and the Iraqi soldiers at the time, um, they grab him off the Humvee, and they pull him off to the other side of it. Did you back off at this point? I did. I walked my linguist back to the truck to get him back on the cam. And just to be clear, when you say linguist, is that just like an interpreter? It's not. A linguist is a, uh, in, the con in this context, linguist translates audio cuts. This individual is a TSSCI cleared person, a U.S. person not a local national interpreter who, you know, he's just the Google Translate on the battlefield. This guy works specifically with me for what I do. Would you have taken him out on those uh, the sniper missions we discussed earlier? The majority of them, yes, sir. Okay. So the two of you step back, what happens next? There's a, there's a good amount of um, people milling about. Uh, Chief Gallagher comes down. I don't know where Chief Gallagher was, but he comes in. And he's always up in an OP observing or, you know, with C2. Um, he comes in, and T.C. Byrne, um, the other medic and my really good friend, and Corey Scott start grabbing med bags and go over to start um, working on this ISIS guy. Okay. Did, you, uh, did you watch him work on this ISIS guy? I did for a bit. I didn't have, um, I didn't really have visual custody of what what each person was doing, um, but for the most part, I was there in the beginning. Gallagher um, Gallagher stands up because there was a whole bunch of Iraqi soldiers crowding around <clears throat> us, and he pushes them off. Um, and TC kneels down, 
and administers a shock to this guy in his left shoulder. He, uh, he stands up and he looks at me and he says, this guy's going to feel everything that we do to him. The smile on his face. What did you understand that to mean? I didn't really, I have absolutely no idea what TC injected in this man or, you know, what else was in his body, but um, this guy goes from being near death. When I TQ'd him on the truck, we could barely hear a word he was saying. He was barely breathing. Um, he cried out when we picked him up, and his lungs kind of cleared of some fluid. And he cried out a little bit um, when he was put on the ground, but he went from being near death to being pretty alert. Now, was that something that you saw Chief Gallagher tell TC Burke to do? No. Chief Gallagher wasn't even aware that TC did this. I'm sitting here messing around on my phone, um, communicating with the SODA through ATAC. If anybody's familiar, it's, it's a chat program. And TC and Gallagher are working on getting this Craig started on this guy. Um, they're having some trouble with it. Villanueva is called over. I do not recall who called him over, but Villanueva is called over to assist. In my peripheral, um, Miller's there chomping down on some food. Um, Petty Officer Miller is milling about, and then he wanders off, and Corey Scott's there. Who's the team next? Villanueva assists and places a chest tube okay. in this guy's left side. Um, and I'm in between the truck and all the Iraqi soldiers and whatever reporting's coming. And then it becomes pretty apparent that Whatever these guys are trying to save this guy's life, it's just not working. He's dying. He's out. And everybody stands up. And about that time, something, somebody starts hammering partner force from a, uh, a structure that was a blown out hotel. And they're taking all sorts of, I think, I think I'm pretty sure ISIS was starting a counterattack. So everybody kind of rushed to go man their positions again. With this all happening, is General Abbas around? He is. Yeah, he's been, he's a larger than life dude on the battlefield, but um, he's sitting here on the phone and, or, you know, on, on two radios and <clears throat> Arabic's coming across both of them at the same time. Okay. Um, so. Now, is everybody, you know, you say everybody moved to respond to the change in the situation? Yes. What happens to the guy? Eric. He's dead. Well, this is the, uh, this is the fruits of my labor on the ground. I was left at my truck. Everybody had moved to BOP, and I decided to take a cool guy trophy photo with my dead ISIS fighter. Now, you, sorry. Did you do that right after everybody left, or was there a break and some of them came back? Yeah, people were milling about. Okay. Who took the picture? Arrington. Would you recognize that picture if I showed it to you today? I would. Your Honor, this is, I would like to show the witness what has been pre marked as defendants golf. Golf, you mean? Says no signal. That is me. Okay. Is this the picture you were just talking about? It is. This is 
us a uh, picture of clear and accurate representation of what's happening <coughs> on the day. Absolutely. I uh, actually went and retrieved my helmet to take my cool guy photo because I was wearing a ball cap uh, for the majority of the morning. And I lifted this guy up, took a couple photos with him. And who took this photo? Harrington did. Your Honor, at this time I would like um, defendants golf admitted into evidence and the words for identification uh, revoked. Government, government objection? No, Your Without objection, defense exhibit golf. For identification is admitted evidence, the words for identification will be stricken. You may proceed. Respectfully request permission to publish to the jury. You may. Most of the platoon, if not all the platoon did. Did Joe Arrington take a picture? He did. We swapped places. What about uh, T.C. Byrne? Absolutely. Frank Miller? Absolutely. Chief Gallagher? Absolutely. Had most of the guys taken these photos before Chief Gallagher or after? Uh, the, the particular order was as guys came into it. Unfortunately, I was the first, or fortunately. They took, uh, each guy took turns. Each guy took turns with the body to take a photo with it. Was there a group photo taken as well? There was. Hold on just a second. Is this still up in front of the members? I, I took it down. Okay, thank you. I don't know what's wrong with the big screen. If you want it on the break screen, we can take a break to make sure that happens. I'm, I'm just going to guess that the people stand, sitting behind me probably want it on the break screen. Oh, but I'm just concerned about that. I mean, the, the, the important people have seen it. Oh. I do. And how do you recognize that? That was the uh, that was the group photo that we took after Chief Gallagher's reenlistment. Right. Your Honor, request permission to publish. Uh, you may. Why did the whole platoon? Hold on, just a second. Let me make sure. Uh, is there any member who does not have prosecution exhibit nine on their screen at this time? That's a negative response from all members. Sorry, defense. Go ahead. Why did the all of you? <coughs> Sustained. Why did you get in the photo? This was a this was a good day. This was a great effort from the entire platoon. This was our um, unofficial war trophy that some of our just like some of our grandfathers took in fighting the Japanese in World War II, just like some of our dads took in Vietnam. This was a platoon effort that everybody was elated and happy about. Everyone in that picture? Absolutely. Craig Miller? Craig Miller. Was anybody talking about how this is actually Eddie Gallagher's knife kill? Not, not a single person. The actual argument was, was I more responsible for the death of this man, Arrington, or the helicopter pilot? Is General LaBosse taking credit for it, too? As I find out later, yes. Now, I want to go to another photo that's already in evidence. If you don't mind. All right, this is Prosecution Exhibit 8. I apologize for not remembering the numbers. 
Your Honor, may I publish the prosecution exhibit A to the jury? You may. Everybody see it? No? That's an affirmative response from all members. Do you remember this thing? I do. On the right side of the neck, there's a bandage. There is. Now, what did you do before taking the picture with this guy? I was fairly strong at the time, and I just wanted to see how heavy he was. I lifted him up by his hair, about six or eight inches off the ground. Not all the way up off the ground, but just the top of his body. Did you see anything when you did that? I did. I saw a whole bunch of holes in this guy from a tube in his side. It looked like a tube in his right side, and his cripe. What about that bandage? The bandage lifted up and stayed stuck to his shirt when I picked him up. And I looked all the way down this man's neck, and I didn't see anything. There was no stab wounds under there? Not a single one. When was the first time you heard anybody talk about Chief Gallagher having stabbed this prisoner? It was after he was arrested. It's a long time later, a year and a half later, isn't it? It is. What happened after that group photo? Crap, I don't even know if the soda was in a Let's Go Home yet. We took the group photo. The re-enlistment ceremony was done, and we were bored. We were still stuck out there. Guys started flying drones. Weren't you able to still support the partner pool? No. They had pushed further from what we had observation or effective. In my particular case, the enemy was too far from me now to be effective in my job. So did you move forward into the reserves? No, we were not allowed from the soda. Or just go home? We weren't allowed to go home. So you're just stuck there? We're stuck there. And what did you guys do? Well, we started flying drones, dipping, drinking chai with the Iraqis. Miller and DeLay were with TC. Everybody was kind of like getting a turn on the drone and how to fly it. Any volunteer upset? Absolutely not. What was the feeling of the group at that time? The feeling that we did a good day's work, but it's time to go home. Did there come a time when you did go home? Yes. About how long after? I can't. I do not recall, but it was probably like an hour later. Okay. And where did you go when you say home? Back to Badoosh. It was our – the soda north forward. And once you got back to Badoosh, what happened? I have a plethora of data that I have to disseminate to the greater intelligence community at this point in time. I typed up a quick little spot rep about the TQ that I did, confirming that that strike that we prosecuted against that C2 guy was successful, and we could basically cross him off of our link analysis. He's dead. And then I went to the gym. Okay. What happened after you finished up at the gym? Well, first of all, did you go home? No, I went with TC Brown. Okay. My roommate. And what happened after you got back from the gym? We actually – we're actually in the middle of working out, and we needed some water, and walked into – the layout of our compound was – there was two houses. Half of the platoon lived – split these two houses. I lived in one half with TC Brown, Corey Pullman, Eddie McNeil, and Portier. And then the rest of the platoon lived in the other house. It just so happens we had the kitchen in our house. TC and I are working out, 
and we're going to get water, and we observe the door open, and the platoon is having a platoon meeting without TC and I. We just walk in? And we walked in. Subject matter being discussed. I walk in to Chief, or uh, Petty Officer Miller is in front of the platoon, instructing the entire platoon to delete all of their trophy photos. And I'm shirtless, sweating, which I was typically was in Iraq, unfortunately for anybody that was there. Um, TC's sweating, we're kind of out of breath, and we're like, what the, what, you know, number one, why weren't we invited to this platoon meeting? And then number two, uh, Miller says there were crimes if we had these photos. He was talking about telling the ISIS guy was a war crime, or having the photo was a war crime? Our trophy photos. Just the photos? Just the photos. Is there any discussion of how he died? Absolutely not. Is there any discussion of get rid of evidence of any stabbing somebody? Absolutely not. Is there any indication that anything had even happened to this guy illegally? Absolutely not. Did other guys delete those photos, to your knowledge? Yes. Did you? I did not. Clearly not. Do you know if anybody else still has their photos? Well, it depends on the answer, so I'll overrule the objection. But you should testify only from personal knowledge, not from what other people may have told you. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I am not aware, although I will say that Arrington and I said it was bullshit, and I very publicly said that it was bullshit. When you say very publicly, you mean what? Miller said war crime about photos, and from my previous experience in being in an actual war, I knew that taking a photo with a dead body was not a war crime. And that's what I told everybody else. Okay. Objection. It's a legal conclusion on fact or jury instruction. Sustained. You should disregard that answer from the witness. You, you voiced your disagreement without getting into the details. I did. Okay. Now, how was the rest of the deployment? Did you, did you remain? I remained with them till the end of the Battle of Mosul, uh, which for, for all intents and purposes was the end of the deployment. Uh, I was on a separate deployment rotation from them, so I rotated home uh, with India Company, 2nd Raider Battalion, India Company. And I believe I returned like three weeks, three weeks or a month earlier. Okay. After you returned, did you maintain contact with the other members of the platoon? Yes, I was very close friends with the majority of them. Ed Galley? Absolutely not. Why? I wasn't friends with them. Is this a D6 chief's issue, or? I didn't particularly like Eddie on deployment. Um, I was very close with T.C. Byrne, um, McNeil, uh, Corey Pullman, a couple of the EOD techs, a couple of the other SEALs. We would go out. Very often, we'd go on trips together, went to Vegas with McCandless and a couple other guys from the deployment. So, um, Eddie, was the, uh, Eddie was the guy that took the, took the Red Bull or screwed around with our care packages or called people pussy or coward. And he's old. And I'm in PB with all the young SEALs having fun. You said... Uh... McNeil, yes. Is he an officer? He is. So you're just continuing to socialize with all the enlisted guys after the deployment? Absolutely. Now, during all of those um, times socializing, <clears throat> did you ever hear anybody talk about Eddie committed a crime? Depends if you say stealing a rebel's a crime. That's in it's been his honor. Aside from, aside from that, has anybody talked about Eddie was shooting civilians? Never once. Eddie stabbed a detainee? Never once. You learned about this from the news, you said, right? I did. After you got arrested? I learned about the investigation from T.C. Byrne. Right. 
I learned about it when he said NCIS raided his house and took the platoon's laptop with all the platoon's videos and photos on it. I believed that they were investigating the entire platoon. I believe they were investigating us for potentially some of these photos getting shared. In addition, depending on who was observing the treatment to that detainee that day, maybe the whole platoon would be looked at as if, you know, something bad happened to this guy. Did you think anything bad had happened? Absolutely not. Now, you heard that Chief Gallagher got arrested on September 11th. I did. Prior to his arrest, did NCIS ever interview you? No, sir. You're clearly in this group photo, right? Yes, sir. Wouldn't it make sense for NCIS to want to interview you? I would assume so. Did there come a time when they did reach out to NCIS? They did. When? Uh, Special Agent Marpinski had called me and left me a few voicemails. Before or after Chief Gallagher's been arrested? It's after. Okay. How did you respond? I didn't answer his phone call. Okay. Why? I didn't really feel like I had any reason to speak to NCIS. Okay. Did you get an attorney? I did. Did you tell him, Special Agent Warpinski, that you had an attorney? Ultimately, yes, I did. Okay. When I finally was ordered to meet him. Okay. Command ordered you to go meet with him. My command, my can't. My command was contacted through the Marsat Jag on the East Coast, all the way through Marsat chain of command from General Yu on down to first reader to first report to to me. So the entire chain of command. Yes, sir. Did you just have to say Special Agent Marpinski contacted your immediate superiors and informed the whole chain of command? No. Why? Because he wanted to go straight to the top, I, I guess. He, Special Agent Marpinski? Yeah. Special Agent Marpinski made sure that the entire, all of Marsoc knew who I was right away. Did you then go to NCIS? I did. I followed the order. Okay. Did you take your attorney with you? I did not. Why? He's up in L.A. He couldn't, couldn't come down. Okay. When you met with Special Agent Marpinski, did you tell him, <coughs> I have an attorney, I want to talk to you another day? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, Special Agent Warpinski had received my representation letter that morning. And I showed up and I told him I didn't wish to give a statement about my attorney. And here I was, um, as ordered, which is a lawful order. So just to be clear, you said you didn't want to give a statement without your attorney. You didn't say, I'm not talking to you at all, right? Well, I'm not going to say anything without an attorney present. Okay. How did he react? He was cool, calm, collected. Um, he said, okay, cool, I get it. I got your, I got your letter. Um, anybody who comes to NCIS ever has to give some biometric information. Okay. Did he? He did. He pulled out this form and said that he just needed to get some basic information. My name, my date of birth, what unit I'm with, what my address was, and I recognize that I'm, you know, I'm giving him, I'm freely giving him this information. Um, I am an intelligence professional. I recognize a, a little bit that this man's drawing information out of me, <coughs> but it's all freely available information. Okay. He then asks me what my clearance was. Okay. And I said, I, I'm not going to disclose that, and we're done here. Like, th that's it. At that point in time, you're interrogating me. He went from being completely calm, cordial, normal, NCIS agent, to getting in my face, saying, fine, we could do this the hard way. He grabs my shoulder and pushes me into an interrogation room and slams the door shut. Did he push you hard? I had just gotten major shoulder reconstruction. It was my first day out of a sling, and he grabbed it and pushed me into that room. If he had done that to... You normally, you know, not with soldier surgery, would it have caused an injury? It wouldn't have caused an injury. It definitely was out of place, but he he sadly hurt me. Okay. What happened next? I did the, uh, I kicked the door 
and I did the uh, am I being detained speech. And I was yelling, am I being detained? He only kept me in there for about a minute, and then he told me to get the fuck out. Did you? I did. Okay. At any time, did the NCIS then reach out to your attorney trying to schedule a follow-on interview? Never again. Did anybody from the prosecutor's office ever contact you to try and get a statement from you? Not once. All right, members, let's uh, take a short recess. Let's uh, return to the deliberation room about 10 of the... <laughs> members, we continue with the examination of Staff Sergeant Carrillo. Government, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, Staff Sergeant. Captain, sir. I want to start off with a few scatter points, and then I'll kind of hone in on some specifics. All right, Staff Sergeant? Okay. The <clears throat> strike on the ISIS commander's building uh, that your SIGINT helped with, that was around 9 in the morning? I believe so, sir. I don't recall the exact time, but it was mid-morning. Okay. You mentioned on direct examination uh, with Mr. Parlatori the couple of specific examples of low act incidents during a low act violation incidents that you recall being reported do you recall that the I, smoke cloud and isis shooting into it do you recall talking about that i recall the propaganda that isis used you know the alleging that we were doing these things the us not not our platoon but the us as a whole i believe it was the army that shot that smoke mission and that was in relation to questions about capability of reporting low act violations while you were on deployment. That was in regards to what the, you know, what ISIS does with dead civilians. Okay. Now, you also used a specific example when you were talking about the intelligence uh, that would you would put out over the comms, and, and that was at a lower level, right? You had to push that down kind of to the secret level for most of the platoon. Yes, sir. And use that example of the, uh, you might put out intelligence at the secret level of someone, hey, here's an ISIS person uh, carrying materials um, to, to resupply. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And then what you would do in response to that situation or that kind of situation would be to uh, call that over the comms to the snipers so that they would know that was a valid target. Yeah, the entirety of the platoon. Sometimes it could be a mortar opportunity or a airstrike. Yes, sir. And so that's how that consistently worked. That was a, a, a part of your role with the platoon was to provide that intelligence um, close to real time to help people identify valid targets. Yes, sir. Now, turning a little bit more generally, and we've already touched on it, uh, your role on the battlefield, and, and please, let's avoid anything classified. I think you've done a great job of that so far. Um, you mentioned several times equipment. So without going into any specific names or anything classified, how much equipment did, did you need to have with you in general to serve your role? A uh, 100-pound ruck with a whole bunch of different gizmos with the media in the room. Okay. So you had the gizmos. Uh, did you have some sort of laptop-like equipment? Um, that, that you did work on while you were in the field? I did. And what kind of, did you have just one comm system or were you in fact patched in at times to multiple different comm systems? Many different comm systems. Well, okay. when you say communications, are you talking about enemy or coalition? Both. Were you listening yes. simultaneously to both? Staff Sergeant, were you listening simultaneously? Would you be listening to I don't, enemy I don't speak Arabic, sir. Okay. So no, I wasn't actually directly listening. But would you listen through that uh, interpreter, the linguist that yes, you sir. described? Um, so you would have some sort of communication set up with them. Would that just be real-time face-to-face? Yes, sir. Okay. So you'd be talking to them. And then what other comms would you have in your ear? It would be in platoon tap. I would also be communicating through a chat application through Secure VPN to the SODIF and tertiary, satcom. <coughs> and that's... Phone. 
that's that? sort of calm. That's sort of calm. That's separate from the platoon tap that you just referenced. The platoon, everyone had access to that sort of calm. But they're separate channels. They are. Okay, so that's two channels right there. And to do your job effectively, uh, you have to be listening to both of those at once, right? That's a, it's like receiving a text message. Yes. Okay. You receive a text message in, in all essence. So on 3 May, for instance, 3 May 2017, uh, when you're operating that day, how many different sources of communications are you, in fact, receiving? What, how much input are you getting? No more than normal. I, and that's what I'm asking. What's normal? How many were you getting that day? So I communicate directly with my linguist. Um, normally, I set up the gear for him to run because I've taught him how to use it. Okay. Two, I communicate with the platoon and platoon tap. Okay, two. And then I would text with the soda. So the soda was only text? Yes, sir. But just a while ago, you mentioned that that was also a separate radio comm as well, in addition to the platoon tap. So was it only text or was it both? No, it's, it's a text, sir. It's a, it's a chat application. I, for, for lack of a better term, it's text. But it's a, it's a secure chat application that everyone had access to for battlefield tracking. And that's on, is that on the kind of laptop you're describing? No, sir. Okay, that's on something else. Now we have another piece of equipment as well that you had to have in that 100 pound rough. No, it's just a phone, sir. Okay, it's on a phone. Yes, so sir. you got a phone. But the platoon tap, that, that was a radio? Yes, sir. Okay. And then also the face to face with your linguist? Yes, sir. And then uh, the laptop that you would occasionally have to use as well? The laptop controls the gear. Okay. Yes, sir. And it sounds like there's additional gear and gizmos in addition to what we've described so far? Yes, sir. And were you utilizing that additional gear and gizmos on 3 May 2017? Based off of the location of the enemy, I was only able to go through the SOTA for precision geolocation. Okay, so you didn't have to use all of it? No. Permission to uh, publish what has already been introduced into evidence as Prosecution Exhibit 16, Your Honor? You may. <clears throat> and actually, before I publish this, I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions. Have you viewed um, any that day of 3 May? Yes, sir. While we were in country, we kind of reviewed all the videotapes. Did you have an opportunity to review that footage in preparation for your testimony with the defense in this case? I saw it. So they showed you some helmet cam footage? I did. How many? Uh, just TC's video. How many times... Um, did you have an opportunity to meet with the defense prior to coming into court? I met with um, an, a DSO investigator who showed me the video, Billy Little. Okay. Billy in, Little. in addition to that, how many times did you have the chance to meet with members of Chief Gallagher's defense team? I've met a few different times with the plethora of attorneys that have represented him. Okay. Uh, can you ballpark it? Are we talking more than five? No. Five would be a probably accurate answer. Okay. So now turning to that video, it sounds like you've had an opportunity to see it. And I'm actually going to cut forward uh, for the record to 49 seconds into Prosecution Exhibit 16, if I can manage it. I'm going to start it at, at 47 seconds to be safe, Your Honor. Oh, and I'll need to hang up the phone. It doesn't look like it's on. Okay, there we go. Lieutenant John is off the line, Your Honor. So playing and publishing Prosecution Exhibit 16. First, can you see that on your screen, Staff Sergeant? I can, sir. And does that appear to be uh, a, a still or a still shot from that video that you've had a chance to see? Yeah, it's me in the left corner. Okay. What, in the left corner, okay, on the very left edge of the screen? Yep, that's me. Thanks. So I'm playing Prosecution Exhibit 16 at 47 seconds. You don't seem to have any volume right now. My apologies, Your Honor. 
So now we're actually at 48 seconds. My apologies to the court for that delay. So I'm going to play the video starting at 48 seconds. Yes, sir. Hey, Eddie, this is for my second strike. You know, it doesn't help. So I'm going to pause it there. And we heard uh, the phrase, hey, Eddie, this is from my second strike. Let me know if you need help. Uh, was that your voice or it was your voice, wasn't it, Staff Sergeant Carrillo? It was my voice, sir. So I'm going to pull that down for the time being. Now, that day, uh, you had participated and, and orchestrated with Petty Officer Arrington the strike on that ISIS commander's building, correct? Uh, along with Lieutenant uh, Portier. He was the actual commander. Okay, so you coordinate the strike. It gets hit. Uh, what, following that, what, what were your duties? What were you doing following that prior to the ISIS prisoner being brought in? I continued to build the intelligence picture, do my functions, in terms of you know, holding my sector of security. By then, partner, partner forces pushed through, so there's not much to shoot at anymore. And monitor the intel situation if there's anything that comes from the SOTA. And it, it sounds like from your job, it, it would be accurate to say that as long as you guys are out in the field, you need to be working. You need to be monitoring those things, don't you? If, if I have the bubble to do that, if I'm within the bubble to do my job, yes, sir. Did you ever at any point that day leave that bubble? Well, the Iraqis had cleared ISIS through my effective range of electronic monitoring. ISIS was beyond the immediate tactical portion. So, so your work that day just stopped following that strike? There's other, there's other functions that I performed, sir, but the, um, my greatest effectiveness is the closest to the enemy, and they were pushed back. And so how many other functions did you have? The SIGINT and targeting, sir. So that, that's what I'm asking. The SIGINT and the targeting sounds like that function was still ongoing then. It was, but it, you know, the, it, it's, a, it's a tempo. Some days you don't get anything. Some days you get a lot. It's, it's not really a, a much, I, I describe it more as an art than a science. And there's other factors in there. They have the other factors being the enemy. Now, you described when the prisoner, the detainee, was brought in, you asked him some questions, right? Yes, sir. But that must have been through your linguist, because you don't speak Arabic? Yes, sir. So you guys asked him some questions, and he, he gave you a number of answers, correct? Yes, sir. And what were those answers again? He, he told us his name. I don't remember. Okay. Did he give you any other information? He said he was 17 years old. What else? He said he was fighting in the Furkan Brigade in a group of six people, and his commander was whoever, whatever his name was, I don't recall. And uh, did he tell you anything else about that commander? He said he's dead. So at that point, it was part of your job to relay that information back, correct? <laughs> I did. And then at some <clears throat> point, uh, where we kind of saw it start in that video, you see uh, Chief Gallagher begin to provide medical treatment to him. Yes, sir. And from that stage, it kind of sounds like you just stand there and watch for a while? I'm not a medic, sir. Oh, I understand. I, and I'm just going back to your testimony on, on direct. You just told us about all the different duties and things you had going on when you were operational. But your testimony was that you essentially watched the entire time that Chief Gallagher, T.C. Burns, and Corey Scott treated that detainee. Isn't that correct? That is correct, sir. I actually um, placed my trained linguist back in the truck to monitor the electronic spectrum. And I went over with the rest of my teammates. And then so for 20, 30 minutes, 
you, not being a medic, just watch three other medics do their job? For the most part, yes, sir. Well, for the most part, because that, that's important right now, those details like that, for the most part. So let's put the most part aside. What were the times that you weren't watching them? Uh, so, for instance, I would look down on my phone, and I would get an update from the soda, and then I would look up, or maybe I put in a dip, maybe I grabbed an MRE, or maybe I walked back over to the truck. I definitely did not main, maintain visual custody of what each person was doing. Okay. And in fact, right now, when you unpack that a little bit, uh, it sounds like there would have been a number of times in that time frame when you didn't maintain visual custody, correct? <coughs> yes, sir. Looking down at your phone to, to see what Soto's telling you, that can be a few seconds, can it? Yes, sir. Only takes maybe a second or even a half a second to stab somebody, doesn't it? I can't answer that, sir. Okay. And then uh, <coughs> when you went back to your truck to get something like you just described, that would have taken even longer than just looking down at your phone, wouldn't it? <coughs> I mean, my truck was right, right here. And you went inside to get something out of it? No, I just would mill around the back. That's where I would talk to my linguist, see if anything's going on. He's very well trained. He would come out and tell me if something was going on. And so, okay, so now we have another thing that may have pulled you away from just kind of staring at the medics and the detainee. Sounds like you talked to your linguist at the truck then? I believe I went over there once, sir, yes. Okay. And uh, at some point, you also maybe were just milling around your truck as well, maybe waiting for your linguist to come out? Like I said, sir, there was a large lull in the bottom. Understood. So I think we can conclude that there was quite a number of times that you weren't actually watching Chief Gallagher and those other individuals with that prisoner. Isn't that fair to say? I don't believe the amount of time that this was taking place was as long as you're making it seem, sir. Okay. It wasn't fair. very, very long. And certainly the medics who treated him would be in a better position to kind of talk about how much time passed, wouldn't they, than you would? Yes, sir. I want to talk a little bit about what happened with NCIS. Now, you got those phone calls from Special Agent Warpensky that was back in <clears throat> October of 2018. He was reaching out to you, leaving voicemails? Yes. And you'd already testified that you knew Chief Gallagher had been arrested for stabbing that ISIS prisoner at that point. Yes. Correct? Sir. But your testimony on direct examination was I didn't call Chief Gallagher or excuse me, I didn't call Special Agent Warpinski back because I didn't think I had anything to add. That's exactly what you said on direct examination, isn't it? Sir, they dragged his family out at gunpoint. If I come out and tell the truth, what are they going to do to me? Did you have a chance to talk to someone about that kind of response? Talk to the lawyer, sir. Okay. And so, uh, here you are, hearing news, that your chief, during that deployment, Chief Gallagher, was arrested for murder. But you didn't want to call and just say, hey, I just happened to look under that bandage and I didn't see a single stab wound. That didn't occur to you? Sir, it occurred to me that an innocent man was arrested and I was afraid what was going to happen to me. But you didn't call. You I didn't. Did. You didn't ask your attorney to give a proffer what you could have told to exonerate Chief Gallagher, did you? Sustained. So, <clears throat> that's October 2018. And then there's November. And then there's December. Now we're in January of 2019. And at this point, you're starting to have some of those meetings with with the defense team in this case, aren't you? I had just come off of convalescent leave for my shoulder surgery, so I was pretty much out for about 45 days. So when was the first meeting with the defense team? I reached out to, uh, I don't know what the exact date is, but 
but I had reached out. You reached out to the defense team? I did. And uh, talked with them that, hey, you know what, instead of going to law enforcement with this, maybe the best thing to do would be to wait until we're on trial and just kind of try and spring my version of events as a surprise. Yeah. That was the decision? Basis? Argumentative. Overruled. Sir, I've been doing this for 14 years. I'm sorry, it's, it's just a yes or no, Staff Sergeant. Was that the decision? No, sir. Okay. You also testified um, that you didn't you didn't care for Chief Gallagher particularly much, isn't that right? Yes, sir. And so uh, you didn't care for him so much that on multiple occasions from July of 2018, uh, March of 2018, you and he would text back and forth after that deployment, wouldn't you? Very, very. We maybe exchanged three or four text messages. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, you tried to arrange to meet up uh, at least one time, didn't you? We had discussed getting a beer at Ballast Point because he left Sculpin. And that was for the person that you didn't particularly care for you were arranging to, to get a beer with? Sure, we were in combat together. <clears throat> Now, I want to play another part of Prosecution Exhibit 16. Permission to publish, Your Honor? You may. I'm starting it at 36 seconds this time. Now, we had a chance to, to hear and identify your voice a little bit earlier, Staff Sergeant. I'm going to play another clip. And so I'm now playing Prosecution Exhibit 16 at 36 seconds. Eddie's about to put him out, dude. Yeah. And that was you that said, Eddie's about to put him out, dude. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. So... You said that because when you had been tapped into the platoon tap earlier, you had heard that initial comm come in about a, a possible casualty being brought into the compound, hadn't you? No, sir. You had heard some discussion over that comm chat about, is it ERD? Isn't that right? No, sir, I didn't hear that. And then you heard the Objection. confirmation. Objection. Basis. Like a foundation, he's already testified he didn't hear these introductory. Uh, statements that the prosecution's making up. How can he hear the response to something he didn't hear the initial one to? All right, overruled. And so then you heard that communication of, wait, he's mine. You heard Chief Gallagher say over the radio once it was determined that it was an ISIS detainee, no one touch him, he's mine. No, sir, I did not hear that. Because that's how you knew, and that's why Objection. you said... Hold on just a second. Members, could we have a short 39A? All right. Everyone, please be seated. Mr. Mazzella, could I see you for a second? Sorry, what's going on, defense? That's how you knew based on a text message that, or a uh, radio call that you didn't even hear? And we're going with, you know, facts, not evidence. Counsel's testifying. He's basically not even listening to the answer, so he can make a show of his own. Yeah, uh, Your Honor, if this is going to be a speaking objection like this, I'd ask at the outset the presence of the witness. 
All right. I mean, I think we're just about there. Okay. My intention is to overrule the objection. I, I understand the objection. You're yeah. invited to, to readdress on, on redirect if you'd like I, to. I will. I mean, it's just, it's not. All right. <laughs> Are we ready to bring the members back in? Defense? Yes, Judge. Government? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Would you ask the members to come back in? <clears throat> For the record, I've had somebody's phone going off in the, in the audience, so I've asked security to check and make sure that we've got our, we're clear to phones. Mr. Carrick is entitled to have his phone to assist with the defense, but no other persons are supposed to have defense phones in the gallery. Everyone, please be seated. Members, I've overruled the objection. Defense, you may, or government, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. So then, Staff Sergeant, you overheard Chief Gallagher say on that comm, no one touch him, he's mine. Objection, that's been answered. Okay. Sustained. Said no. <clears throat> you testified you didn't hear that statement, but it was all those statements that you denied hearing. That's why you said Objection. Eddie's going to put him out. Objection. Basis. When did you stop beating your wife? So it's based on all the statements you deny hearing that you decided to say this. All right. Uh, I'm going to overrule the objection. It, uh, I would like you to ask the question and allow the witness to answer the question. You understand? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And that's why you <clears> said <throat> Eddie's going to put him out in that video. No, sir. That was my own statement. Now, I want to move forward a little bit after the detainee's dead. You talked about uh, a decision to, to lift him up. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Why did, you, why did you want to lift up that detainee at that point? I just wanted to see how heavy he was. So because you were curious at how heavy that 17-year-old you had just chatted to was, uh, you lifted him up with blood around his neck, and uh, he's got all these tubes sticking out of him. That's at the point that you decided to lift him up? Sir, I had to reposition him in order to take my trophy photo with his head on my boot like he was a dead deer. So that's a, that's a different answer now, though, because before you Objection. said you wanted to lift Objection. him up. Basis? Counsel's testifying, mischaracterization. Overruled. Go ahead. Moments ago, you testified uh, you lifted him up because you wanted to know how heavy he was, correct? Yes, sir. And then now you just testified, I wanted to lift him up so I could reposition him for my trophy photo. And I moved him a little a few times in order to get the right photo. And it was in the course of moving him on one of those several occasions uh, he testified that the bandage on his neck flipped up. Is that right? Came forward, sir. Came forward. That's the bandage on his neck that was, in fact, sealed by a plastic halo seal, correct? Objection. It wasn't sealed, sir. Basis? Again, facts, not in evidence. If you look at the picture, it's clearly not sealed. Uh, your Honor. O o overruled. <laughs> Continue. Thank you, Your Honor. So as you test me, no, the, it was not sealed by a halo seal. And you also testified that during the presence of that treatment that you watched so intently, it was SOC Miller? Uh, was Where was he? He had, uh, he had walked behind uh, TC and I. He was eating an MRE, MRE, and he walked back to his truck. And then SO1 Scott was there as well? He was. And SO2 Villanueva? Yes, sir. One moment, Your Honor. 
Peng testified on direct examination that uh, T.C. Byrne made a comment to you at one point during that treatment, correct? Yes, sir. That now he's going to feel everything or something to that effect, right? Yes, sir. But you didn't try to stop him or intervene at that point, did you? I had no idea what he meant, sir. You didn't care. I mean, he just told you he's going to feel everything right before he started to perform a cricothyroidectomy on him. Isn't that your testimony? I had no idea what he meant. He was my best friend, sir. I let's, just took the information. Let's just keep it clear. You heard that statement. Yes, sir. And then you saw T.C. Byrne and Chief Gallagher start to perform the crike on the detainee. That was your testimony, right? Yes, sir. But you didn't know what he meant? No, sir. Is it it's possible that maybe you, you had an interpretation, you just didn't care about what T.C. Byrne had told you. Isn't that right? Sir, I don't... It's just a yes or a no. I don't have immunity. I have to tell you the truth. I don't know what T.C. meant when he said that. It is something that I have thought about for many, many, for a year now. I want to step back on that Plus. line for just a second. I asked you something about what T.C. Byrne had said and your observations of it, and then you brought up the fact that you don't have immunity. Is that right? Yes, sir, I know. And that's another one of the things that was kind of discussed to maybe bring up in your preparation with defense counsel, wasn't it? Just kind of volunteer that I don't have immunity, correct? Absolutely not, sir. So you hear T.C. Byrne make that statement, start to operate on the detainee, and you do nothing to intervene, yes or no? Didn't look like that there was anything out of place, sir. It just looked like normal medical treatment. Because the detainee, in fact, did not react unusually. He did not start to scream out in pain or writhe and thrive while they did that to him, did he? He didn't cry out after the crike got him. Did he cry out while they were applying the crike? He had made some moaning, yes. He, had, he made, I would say, some intense moaning. So, so just some moaning while they were slicing into his throat? Yes, sir. Nothing further this time. And I, I apologize, Your Honor. I'm taking prosecution at 16 down. Thank you. Redirect. Uh, sure. Sergeant, you were just asked a whole bunch of questions about why you didn't <coughs> proffer to the prosecutor. Is that right? I only learned what a proffer was after I read Lieutenant McNeil's. Okay. I've never even heard it, the phrase. Now, throughout this process, you've heard a lot about NCIS and the prosecutor's office, haven't you? Yes, sir. Heard about prosecutorial misconduct? Yes, sir. Heard about manufacturing evidence to try and frame Eddie Gallagher? Objection. Absolutely. Uh, so, no, he went hey, into... Oh, hey, hold on, everybody, please. All right. What's the basis of the objection? Outside the scope of cross-examination relevance. All right. I'm going to overrule the objection. But I will um, caution the members that this is just being asked uh, in order to uh, gauge the witnesses own personal opinions about the process and not for the truth of any of the matters asserted by the questioning. So you may proceed. <clears throat> you had heard about misconduct by the prosecutors? Not, not necessarily these individual prosecutors, but misconduct by prosecutors in this case? Yes, sir, I have. How did that affect your desire to call them up and say, hey, I want to tell you that you're doing the wrong thing? I really felt like it didn't matter what I said or what I did. Um, even going to tell them the truth, it, it wouldn't have made a difference. And frankly, I'm kind of scared of some backlash. Okay. Now, and again, after you had that meeting with Special Agent Warpensky, did anybody reach back out to you to say, hey, we'd like you to come back in? No, sir. Did anybody reach out to your attorney to say, we'd like you to come in? No, sir. About two weeks ago, was your name in 
the Navy Times. Yes, sir. And what did the Navy Times say about you? The Navy Times said that I was expected to that testify. Was, uh, not for the truth of the matter. All right, members, if you'll excuse me just for a second. All right. <clears throat> Please be seated. Staff Sergeant Krill, if you just step outside just for a second. Yes, sir. If it's not enough for the truth, what's the what's its purpose? To be a fact, two weeks ago there was a Navy Times article that said he was going to be a defense witness who was going to testify that there was no stabbing, and yet after being Put out in world uh, nationwide news that he's going to be a witness to say there was no stabbing. Nobody called him. Nobody said, "Hey, can you come in? We have equal access to witnesses." They never even got to the point of him. You know, if if he would have refused, if he would have complied, if they would have had to go for an immunity deal, they didn't do any of that stuff because after Special Agent Warpinski grabbed him roughly by the shoulder. Even though they, he's clearly in no, these photos. I've the got video. you. I've got you. All right. I'll, I'll overrule the objection. Would you ask the witness to rejoin us? Staff Sergeant Carrillo, if you'd please return to your place in the witness stand. Yes, sir. Are we ready to recall the members' defense? Defense, are we ready to recall the yes, members? Judge. Government? Yes, Your Honor. Everyone, please be seated. Members, I have overruled the objection. Defense, you may proceed. What did the Navy Times say about you two weeks ago? The, the Navy Times uh, promoted me to gunnery sergeant, for one, which I appreciate, and published my full name, as well as that I was a raider, and said that I was going to be testifying on behalf of Chief Gowler. Did it say what you were expected to testify to? The truth. Say specifically that you were expected to testify that Eddie Gallagher never stabbed this prisoner. Yes, sir. After that went out on nationwide, worldwide internet news, did anybody at this table call you up and say, hey, we'd like to talk to you? No, sir. Did anybody from NCIS call you up and say, hey, we hear you're going to be a witness to this, we'd like to talk to you? No, sir. Did anybody from the government side ever reach out to you in any way to say, we just read in the Navy Times that you have information that there was no stabbing, can we talk to you? Nobody has reached out to me since I was thrown into that interrogation room. You were asked a bunch of questions about things that might have distracted you while, while the medical treatment was going on? Yes, sir. Did anything distract you when you looked under that bandage? Not a thing. What did you see under the bandage? There was no stab wound. There was a crike. There was a little bit of blood. And there was a nasty yellow shoulder. Now, you were asked about text messages with Eddie Gallagher. Yes, sir. Initially, when you came back, were you very close to these other E6 members of the Best friends. Describe your relationship with PC Brown. If I ever get married, if I ever get married again, I wanted TC to be the best man at my wedding. I have stayed at his house. We have gone drinking. We have gone sailing. Uh, we would talk for hours on the phone when he was in green team. Uh, through selection and through some of his, uh, when he failed CQC and then went to, um, got orders out of the teams. Um, he told me about NCIS raiding his house and taking his laptop. 
her laptop with all of her photos on it. Um, and he was my main conduit of information um, based when I thought the tune was getting investigated. But absolutely, an absolute brother. Is he still an absolute brother? Not once he started lying. What do you mean? He's lied to me. About? About his conduct that day. TC said he uh, lost his sunglasses in the course of uh, the treatment, and he went to go retrieve them. And he certainly didn't misplace his sunglasses that day, but it wasn't during the treatment of that dying ISIS fighter. What about the rest of the platoon? Are you still friends with all these other E6s? I have maintained contact with some of those who um, haven't lied to me and really haven't said anything. I know. Why? Because he is a liar. No further questions. Cross? Yes, sir. When did you read Lieutenant McNeil's proffer? Published <clears throat> in the Navy Times. What else have you had a chance to read? Um, I remember the original reporting said I think Eddie popped that dude's head off. What else? Not really that much. I was obviously very interested that my name was going to get mentioned to the national news media, and I did not want it to be so. That just happened to be the one article you read about this case was Lieutenant McNeil's proper? I mean, there was plenty of stuff in the Navy Times, but it was all very inaccurate to what happened. You got a chance to look at some of the other investigative materials, didn't you? Not really. Well, what's not really? I mean, it's either yes or no. So did you see other investigative materials? I was recounted what other people had allegedly said. How many times were you recounted what other people had said? Just really when it was coming around uh, based off of um, how Miller was lying and how, uh, what TC said he was doing. Nothing further. Redirect. No, Judge. Thank you. Members, are there any questions for this witness? That's an affirmative response from Commander Carlson. And from Senior Chief Doyle.
All right, I have what's been marked as appellate exhibits 169 and 170. Staff Sergeant Carrillo, when did you read Lieutenant McNeil's proffer in Navy Times? I don't remember the exact date, sir, but certainly whenever around the time it was published. And when did you obtain an attorney? I obtained an attorney when the command was getting ready to, um, basically when the when Marsoc was contacted um, on the East Coast. Do you remember what month or year that was? December of last year. When you uh, took the first pick with the ISIS fighter, was there blood on the ground near his head? Yes, there was. Could you um, describe for us how you picked up the ISIS fighter by his hair? Yes, sir. Picked him up, uh, I just grabbed him at the top of his head, and I lifted him up a couple times. Um, it's a sack of dead potatoes, so you lift up a dead person, it's a little, a little bit different. Um, and then I placed him on my foot. Any additional questions from the members? That's a negative response from all members. Defense, any follow-up based upon the members' questions? No, sir. Government, any follow-up based upon the members' questions? No, Your Honor. Defense, is this witness subject to recall? Yes. Oh. Staff Sergeant Carrillo, you are temporarily excused. During the pendency of this trial, you're directed not to discuss your testimony with anyone other than the counsel in this room. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. You may step down. Members, I think it's a good time for us to take a recess. So if you'd be back in your deliberations by 5 of the hour, I would appreciate it. All right. <clears throat>